And we're back for week three of Business Myths. Hey everyone, it's uh, David Barnett from davidcbarnett.com, the blog site, YouTube channel, iTunes, SoundCloud, Google Play podcast, where I talk about buying, selling, financing, and managing small and medium-sized businesses. This week I've got Hugh, who's back, Hugh, Hugh Godman. And uh, it's good to see you again. We, Hugh compiled all of the business myths that you guys had sent in by email and sorted them by category. And um, we've been going through these. We've got, there's two other weeks that we've made videos. If you haven't seen them, you can go back and take a look on the channel. Um, but these are myths that people have sent in. We're discussing whether or not we agree that these are myths or not. So, so where we arrived at, Hugh, on our, on our schedule here? So we're at taxes. taxes. Uh, this, is, this is from Sandra. And she says, if your business makes less than $10,000 a year, you do not need to pay taxes. I think they think of income tax brackets. Yeah. So there's a whole bunch of myths circulating around businesses and, and revenues. So, and it relates to two different kinds of taxes, income taxes and sales taxes. So in many jurisdictions, if you have a super small business that, you know, here where I live, we have HST sales tax. If your business doesn't do 30,000 a year in sales, you do not have to register for that. So what that means is, is that you don't get to claim back the sales tax that you paid on things. So the government's still going to get sales tax. They're just getting it from the people that you bought from. And they're, they're saying that you're too small for them to worry about, you know, the, the value you're going to add. And there's exceptions to that though. So hairdressers and taxi drivers, they don't, they can't use that option. So whether, even if they're only bringing in 10,000 a year, they have to register for the sales tax. And so the, the rules about that kind of stuff can vary tremendously from one jurisdiction to another with respect to sales taxes, with respect to income tax. Again, yeah, I think Sandra's right. People are thinking about personal taxes in a lot of places, people, individuals can earn a certain amount of money without, before they have to pay income tax. And it's not the same for a business. If you're incorporated or, you know, depending on your different legal structure, if you have a profit, you typically owe money. And in some places, uh, I've seen this on some American tax returns, if you choose the wrong kind of entity, even if you don't make money, you still may be subject to a minimum tax which could be calculated as a percentage of the revenue of the business. Did you know that? It's, I it's did not know that. It's terrible. I've seen tax returns for corporations that probably should have been organized as LLCs and they lost money and they still had to pay taxes, sometimes tens of thousands of dollars. So yeah, when it comes to taxation, uh, there are three things we have to remember. CPA. You need professional help in the jurisdiction that your business is located in uh, because those guys are going to be able to, to help figure out exactly what you do owe. Let's move on to the next one. So the next one is uh, also by Sandra. It says, costs of goods sold are non-taxable. Biggest lie. Sorry, sorry. Uh, cost of goods are non-taxable. Biggest lie. Cost of goods sold. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, let me help you. So what she's saying is that the cost of the, the myth is that the cost of goods are not taxable. And, and she said, that's a lie. It's the cost of goods sold that are non-taxable. Uh, yes, yes. Okay. And then she goes on to say, this one actually hurt me in my first year in business because I was investing all the revenue back into inventory. So what, what is the difference here? And this is where a lot of new business people fall down because business people tend to look at the income statement and they, don't understand or look very much at the other thing called the balance sheet. And so the balance sheet has something on it called inventory. So if I buy a hundred widgets, a hundred dollars worth of widgets, then the moment I buy them, have I made any money? No, there's, there's no sales on my income statement at that moment. But what happens is the cash on my balance sheet goes down by a hundred dollars and the inventory goes up by $100. So buying that inventory has not affected my income at all. However, it's made my cash go down. So, and then if I went and I made a sale, let's say I sold $50 of those widgets for $60, right? What would happen in that moment 
is my inventory now goes down by 50 because I've sold $50, my cost of widgets, to someone else for $60. And so on my income statement, I'll have sales of 60, cost of goods sold is 50, leaving me with a gross profit of 10. Now that $10, assuming we have no expenses, that $10 is our profit. That's what we're going to pay tax on. And so what happens though, is if you keep taking your profit and you keep buying more inventory, then you end up with a bunch of inventory and you have no cash. And then you find out later that you actually had a profit and you owe taxes. Mm. Right? So if we took that $10 and we bought more inventory, then we have no money left. And this is where you get into trouble. And I've seen this happen with a lot of new people and this is how it happens. They buy an initial inventory and then the salesman comes along and says, Hey, did you know that if you buy a hundred of them, I can give you a better price. And thinking about the income statement, the business owner says, wow, if I can reduce my cost, I can earn a bigger profit. So they start investing in larger and larger inventories to reduce their costs. And then they end up owing money and they don't have any cash. And then you get it. The profit they made, the, the profit they made doesn't disappear because they buy more inventory. Right. Exactly. And so the profit is with them. It's just in the form of inventory instead of cash. And so then you end up with an inventory reduction sale. So people can pay income tax. It's a circle of life. Um, which it is a great myth because um, I've run into people who will say, I need to reduce my income for the year. So they go and they, so they figure that they're going to buy a bunch of stuff in December thinking that acquiring the inventory is going to cause their profitability to go down for the year. And then of course the question is, well, are you properly counting your inventory at the end of the year? Because if they are, then that's not what's going to happen. What, mm. what usually happens then is then they have to, they miscount, miscount their inventory to, uh, to manage their tax burden. And then they just end up with a problem that snowballs one year after another. And so when they get into that and then they decide to sell the business, one of the things I see is that they could have $300,000 of inventory on the balance sheet, but in reality, there's far more in the warehouse uh, because they've been playing this trick one year after another and just kicking the can down the road, hiding profit in inventory. Anyway, I digress. What's our next category, Hugh? So the next category is customers. Mm -hmm. And this is one that was sent in both by Eric um, and by, uh, Justin and mm -hmm. it's the customer is always right. Yeah. Uh, what do you think? I, this should not be true. It, well, I don't think it's true. I I've had so many instances in, in business and in jobs that I've had where customers have no idea what they're doing and no idea what they're talking about. And so the problem then is, um, managing customer expectations in my mind. It's the number one job of any salesperson or customer service representative is, is to properly manage the expectation of the customer so that they know what is likely going to happen uh, with the product or service that they're going to get. Um, yeah. And do you think that's achieved through say marketing? It can be, it depends what you're selling. So, you know, if you're selling, you know, grass seed, yeah, it's going to be, you have to set expectations with the marketing that you put out there and the packaging that someone's going to buy at the store. If you're selling, you know, more complex item where someone's going to deal with a salesperson, like if you're selling a boat, you know, for example, expensive item, then yeah, the, the salesman is going to have to explain exactly what it is that they're getting so that there isn't a mismatch. Because if, if someone is expecting to get a Mercedes for the price of a Chevrolet, then they're not going to be happy when they get on the road and they find out the Chevrolet isn't going to go as fast as the Mercedes or whatever the metric mm. is, right? It's, it's always about managing expectations. When I was a business broker, I used to explain to people all the time, the deal will not close on time. You, whatever the offer is, if you think it's great, you'll likely not get the full amount because there will be some kind of adjustment that will happen between now and closing. And there's going to be other problems that will come up. You know, you agree to finance this amount today after he goes to the bank and he gets declined for the loan, you'll probably end up having to finance more. And I would keep warning people 
about these problems that were going to occur. And then they would happen and people would say, wow, it's just like you said. Versus being disappointed that all of a sudden they've got, it's like they run into a brick wall. That's not what you want. You want people to have an idea of where they're headed. So customer expectation. No, the customer isn't always right. Um, we have to lead them to show them what to expect so that they're not disappointed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the next one is the customer won't pay that much for it by error. Yeah. yeah. I, I think this is a really big myth and I ran into this last weekend actually. Um, my, uh, my barbecue is at the end of its life and I ha it's a propane barbecue where you have to go fill up the tank whenever it gets empty and I heat my home with natural gas. So I thought to myself, this is it. I'm going to go and get one of those outlets on my house. I'm going to get a new barbecue that plugs into the house. So I never have to go and get propane again. And I went to a barbecue place and the guy clearly did not want me to buy a natural gas barbecue. He was trying to sell me an end of season overstock propane barbecue. And I, I went in there and I said, I want to buy a natural gas barbecue and have the thing on my house that I can plug it into. And he said, well, you know, depending on where your gas line is in the house, it can cost up to a thousand dollars to install that. It's really expensive. And, and so he was trying to dissuade me and I, I ended up leaving that place. I didn't like how he totally ignored what I wanted and tried to sell me what he wanted to sell. But um, I started to think about what I would do if I were him, if I was trying to sell natural gas barbecues and the little outlets on the side of the house. And I was thinking, you know, if I were a doctor or a lawyer who charged $300 an hour, right? How much does it really cost me to have to run out on a last minute basis and go fill my propane tank. If that's an hour long errand or a 30 minute errand that I hadn't planned on, that's like $150 of my time wasted when I should be either working with clients to earn $300 an hour or at home enjoying myself with the barbecue, right? Mm -hmm. So if I was that guy, I would have said, hey, you know, is your time really valuable? Because natural gas can be one of the best investments that a busy professional can make. And here's why. Most people fill the propane tank three times a year. If I can save you three hours of your summer for the next 20 years, does it matter if it costs 800 or $1,000, right? And so, and so how you position it and what that, how that person values the time could mean that $800 or $1,000 is cheap. As it turns out, I called a natural gas installer. He stopped by my house. It's only going to cost me $200. So it's like a no brainer. Of course, I'm going to get the little thing on my house, right? Because I don't want to have to run, because with my luck, when I need to get the propane tank filled, the hardware store is closed and I have to go to the corner store and it's like 50 bucks there to swap, you know, one of those tanks. It's crazy. So yeah, I would agree. This is a huge myth. The customer won't pay that much for it. We have no idea what the utility and value is in the customer's mind unless we try to empathize with the customer and maybe talk to a few of them and figure out why it makes sense for them at a given price point. That's, I think that's very wise. So, so you would say the best way to gauge the price would be to, to just go out and, and, talk with customers like surveys things like that yeah well i think that if you're if you if you have a product or service you're trying to sell you figure out who is likely going to want to use it and then what exactly is the problem that it solves because in my mind the pricing for anything should be based on value so if i have something that's going to literally save someone three or four hours every summer and they're a busy professional who can bill out their time at a high rate it's very easy to make the logical connection. Hey, you know, if I save you three hours, it's like saving you $900 of time. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. time is money. If, if, if they could spend their time in the office with clients, they would have that money in their pocket. And so the payback on this little installation is going to be very easy. And it's like that for any product or service, really, you know, mass market goods, it's a little bit different, but still what is the value to the person? Um, you know, I saw a little thing advertised on Instagram the other day and it's like a plastic thing you put in your kitchen to organize 
your rice and your beans and your peas and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, what's the price of it? It's the, all that stuff is twenty nine ninety five, right? And for a dollar more, you can have a second one, just pay for shipping or, or whatever. The, the deal is always the same. You could probably find a little plastic doohickey that would have a similar utility down at the dollar store. But by presenting it right there at that place at that time with the one click ordering, actually the way it's sold even represents a value to someone, mm -hmm. right? Because now they can just click, enter their address and it's on its way. They don't even have to go, you know, and spend time trying to figure out a solution on their own. So I agree. We don't know how much a customer will pay unless we can figure out what, what it's worth to them, what the value is. Mm -hmm. And you shouldn't underestimate your, your product or your service. Exactly. One of, you know, I call it negotiating against yourself. And it's one of the things that I see people do all the time when they're negotiating the purchase or sale of a business is they will start to think of reasons why what they want isn't going to be accepted. And then they'll start to whittle down their demand. And I'll say, don't negotiate against yourself. You present what you want. It's there. They'll whittle you down. Don't worry. They'll, they'll come back with something else. You don't go in there with a watered down presentation or offer. You put forward what you want and then wait for them because mm -hmm. you might be surprised what they want. They might not be thinking the same thing you are at all. Mm -hmm. Makes good sense. All right. Shall so, we move yeah. on to operations? Yeah, let's do operations. Okay. The schedule says we can't get it done in the requested time frame by Eric. So I ran into this one today. Um, the people who are members of Business Buyer Advantage, the group coaching program, Business Buyer Adventure group coaching program, uh, they get a, a binder with the notes from all the past meetings and stuff and when they join. And I get a nameplate made to stick onto the binder. And I send them in usually the, the week before the end of the month and I want them for a month end so I can mail them out. And today I called the, the engraving and trophy shop where they're made. And I said, yeah, I'm looking for this order. I sent it in last week. And they said, oh, we're really busy. We're, we have about a two, hour, two week lead time now. And I said, no, nah, the first was on Saturday. I need to get these in the mail today. Can you have them done today? I'm supposed to mail them out at the beginning of the month. And they said, okay. And an hour later, they emailed me and said they were ready. So again, this is all about expectations. And there's a big difference between my two little nameplates and producing a thousand widgets in a factory, right? And so sometimes maybe you can fit it in and sometimes maybe you can't. I think, again, managing expectations is the key. In, in, in what way would you say you need to manage expectations with regards to the delivery time? Well, so in this case, you know, and he's got it in quotation marks, the schedule says we can't get it done in the requested time frame. If, if you really can't, then it's important to let the customer know hmm. so that they're not making decisions counting on it being delivered on a certain day, right? And, it, and again, as long as you can manage expectations and know, let someone know that there may be a delay to what they're asking for, well, then maybe they can make follow-on decisions about other things that can help mitigate that for them. But if they're in the dark, they can't make any decisions. And, and I'm then, they'll, then they'll be upset when you tell them later that it's not being delivered when they thought. Right, right. And I'm curious, the, the next time you talk to this, uh, this business you were dealing with for the, the plaques, are you going to believe them when they say that they can get it done in the requested time? Well, I don't know. Like, like, like sh should they have, should they only say they can't get it done if it's really impossible or sometimes should they make exceptions like they did? Well, I know that my job was really small, so I can imagine they just slipped it in between two other things. Okay. So, so if my, if my order was 500 medals for a baseball tournament, I don't think they probably would have had the flexibility to do that. Mm -hmm. Right. So, but so for the, for this are, they, are they teaching, they... are they teaching me that I can just demand service whenever I want? Is that really what your question is? 
Yeah, essentially. Yeah, or, maybe. Or is, is their word, um, get, can you take their word for it at this point? Well, you know, that brings me back to those old original Star Trek episodes, right? Whenever Scotty said it was going to take 10 hours to fix the engine and he really got it done in 90 minutes or something. He just, he just trained Captain Kirk to know that he could always press him to do the work faster. Right. <laughs> Are you familiar with that program, Hugh? Vaguely. Okay. <laughs> but I, I, I know Scotty because of the newer movies. I, I become more familiar. All right. Cool. We can do the, the next one. Yeah. Uh, so this is about uh, absentee ownership and it's from uh, Troy. So mm -hmm. absentee ownership from the get-go. I will buy this business and run it owner absentee right out of the gate. This may be possible if it is already being run owner absentee or if it is big enough, but don't expect that from a very small business where the current owner is the business. Yeah, I agree with almost in this entirely. Yeah, and, um, and the next one is the same. It's uh, the idea that a successful business can be hands-off. It will just run itself from day one, and that's from uh, Janet. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, even if a business <clears throat> does not have the owner present in it, if at one time the owner was the manager, then they're able to run it absentee because they understand the business inside and out and they have the skills and knowledge to be able to get the information they need from the management that's in place in order to know that the business is operating properly. As a new owner, you probably don't have all that experience. And so it's, it would be very difficult unless you had similar industry experience in another company in that same industry for you to be able to come in and have that same supervisory capacity that the, that the seller has. And so in almost every case, um, when I see someone who can, who, and there are very few people I've known who can go in, buy a business, very few people I've known personally, I should be clear, that I've had conversations with and talked with about this topic, have been able to buy businesses and then get managers in place and run them in an absentee way. Uh, I know there are people out there who, who've pulled it off, but the ones who, who do it when they initially buy the business, they're in there full time and they learn the business so that they can then understand what systems and reporting and bits of information they need in order to run it in an absentee capacity. So how fast do you think that can be done? It depends on their experience and the industry. So if the buyer is someone with 15 years of restaurant management experience and they buy a restaurant, a lot of their experience is transferable. They get in there, they see how things are run. They go through all the numbers, they measure the portion sizes, they check to make sure, you know, all these things are correct. Then they get their baseline of data where with them supervising operations, you know, what the cost of goods should be on average. Right. And then they can back off and they're looking at certain numbers. So, uh, a friend of mine has been involved with owned, operated, bought and sold seven different restaurants. He was once alerted to something going wrong in one restaurant because the cost of goods sold went off by a tiny percentage. And in the end, he found that a manager had stolen a case of frozen chicken breasts. Wow. But it's only because everything was measured. Every portion on every plate was measured. Everything was very precise. Employees were not allowed to have free food. They could buy at a discount, but the way it was recorded showed a sale. And then later there was an expense for employee promo so that his cost of goods sold would always be in line. And he knew that that was the number one number he had to keep an eye on. And when it went off, he questioned why. And so he was alerted to a problem and he went and investigated and he ended up doing inventory, a whole bunch of extra times. And then he ended up going through, you know, purchases and everything until he finally found it, the problem. Hmm. So even as in an, an absentee owner, he was able to still keep a close eye on the operations. Even as an absentee owner, this guy would have to spend three to five hours a week watching what was going on in the business. Hmm. And so if you think about businesses that are run normally in an absentee fashion from ownership, 
you look at chain businesses, big chains. So if you imagine a convenience store chain or a gas station chain, each location has a manager. But, you know, if Exxon's got 100 gas stations in an area, well, there's now these regional managers who are looking at the reporting of each individual store. So they're managing the managers. That's the skill set and capacity that you need to have as an absentee owner is how to observe the business from numbers to make sure that it's operating properly and know what bits of information you have to be looking at on a regular basis to make sure things are okay. You can't just walk away from it and leave it in the hands of a manager unless you're prepared to wait for a year to find out what happened in the business with when the financial statements are put together for taxes. Mm -hmm. And then it's too late. Now you're looking at numbers that could be as much as 14 months old and it's telling you there's something wrong in the business. And then what do you do? Complain to the manager who was supposed to be running it properly or fire the person? And if you fire them, who does their job? So this is why even in these dreamy situations that people get into of I'm gonna be an absentee owner, you have to know the business. And then usually you have to spend some time in it to learn it, to really know it. Okay, we can move on to uh, feedback, I think. Yeah. Our last section. Getting the sale is all the feedback you need by Eric. Yeah. What do you think about this one? Well, somehow I think that it's, it is a good indication, obviously, but it it couldn't possibly be enough. I mean, to, you don't know um, perhaps what you're missing out on. Um, you, you don't know a lot of things from the information that you get from sales. What, what you don't learn from sales is, is whether your success is based upon what it is that you're doing, or if it's based upon the absence of choice. Hmm. So if you're the only gas station on a hundred mile stretch of highway, you could have plenty of sales. And every person could hate doing business with you and find that the bathrooms are gross and your floor is dirty and they really don't like anything about your business, but it still succeeds because they have no choice. Right. And that makes you vulnerable for, you know, if there are changes coming up in the future. Yeah, exactly. Right. Or you could learn that, you know, you're selling a whole bunch of one thing, but what people really want is something else. And if you offered that new product or service, your sales could grow. So, I would, I would um, say that, yeah, this is a myth. I think that you want to have feedback from your customers and it can surprise you what people say. So, um, you know, for my online courses, for example, I have an automated email that a certain uh, number of days after somebody buys one of the online courses, they get an automated email that invites them to come and fill out. Uh, it's just a, a survey where they can fill in boxes where it asks them different questions. And some of the feedback that I've gotten has been surprising. And sometimes the feedback will uncover some problem in the customer's user experience. So someone will say, there should have been this. And I'll look at that and I'll go, that's in there. Mm. They just missed it somehow. So I'll send them an email and I'll say, look, you filled this out in the feedback form. And did you know this is where it is? And then they'll be very happy. And their opinion will then change entirely, right? And it didn't have, and, and then I'll think about it. And I'm like, yeah, maybe there's a different way I should do this. And the culmination of the feedback actually led me to introduce these video. All of my courses have a video called Watch Me First, where it's a basically, this is how you use this. And it's a little a couple minute video where I take people through and this is how you start. And this is the book. And this is the way you do this. To, to try and alleviate some of the problems that were coming up in the feedback. I would not have been able to innovate and improve the product if it weren't for those comments. Mm-hmm. And as a result, since doing that, now I get more consistently positive feedback. So the key is a variety of different feedbacks, not just financial. Yeah, you, you actually want to have conversations, I think, with your customers mm-hmm. and, and find out why they're coming to you, why they're buying, 
and why they made the choice and would they come back and would they tell other people to come to you? Right. And, and those I think are the important questions because if they, they wouldn't send someone, one of their friends to come and see you, then I think that under, that underscores that there's something wrong with your business. You need to be improving in some way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hugh, this has been awesome. We're at the end of the list, but okay. I think I made some fun videos. Um, and uh, how are you enjoying uh, your work with me so far this summer? I am learning a lot and I am um, just enjoying exploring the world of small businesses because as you mentioned, uh, I think in a past video, we don't get that um, in, in our business education uh, as much as I'd like. It's more about big corporations. So I'm very much enjoying it. Yeah, cool. Well, I'm glad. And uh, don't forget everyone, if you don't want to miss any of the new videos, um, head over to davidcbarnett.com. It's my blog site. If you scroll down on the left, there's a form there you can fill in where you can join the email list and you check off the categories of topics that you're interested in. And so you only get emails about those topics. One of them is called weekly new video digest. And that's when the new video comes out every week and, and you won't miss any of the videos if you get on the list. And with that, we'll see you next time. Cheers.